Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad, I'm back and dressed in black for another FAC Friday. So I do hope you've had a wonderful week, a marvelous week, should we say. And uh, we decided, uh, actually, Eric was looking around and we've got about 40 guitars or maybe 50, we've got a lot of guitars. And he said, I think we've done every single guitar and bass in the studio for our guitar of the week. I'm not sure if we have, but there's one we don't know that we've done before. And that would be this. This is, it looks like an EBO bass. It's not, it's actually a Japanese copy. It says made in Japan there. We're thinking it could have been an Ibanez. We don't know, but it's a bolt on neck EBO copy. Um, but probably the thing that's most interesting is it's painted like the full guitar. The full guitar, of course, is the famous Eric Clapton SG that was painted basically identically to this. This is an incredible reproduction of it. Now, I love this bass. There's two things I love about it. First of all, it's got flats on it. So it's got a very unique sound. It's still got the dampener here. So if I relax the springs here, I can actually get um, I can actually get the the rubber to come up and deaden those strings even more. So you get a really super, a really amazing lack of sustain, but total. You know, because what did Carol K used to do? I can't remember. She used to stuff a piece of foam down there to get that specific sound. It's really amazing. It's just got that sort of mate. And what I love about it being a guitar player is it's got a really super skinny neck. So it's got like a, I don't know, like an SG neck, like an SG guitar neck. It's really, really easy to play. Can whiz around in it. Play legato lines. But honestly, most of the time I just use it for like. It's just a great. Now I also have a um, Hofner, Hofner bass, which I got from Sweetwater. They had some stupid deal on them and it was the cheapest one they make. It's only a few hundred dollars and I got it even cheaper. And it's a wonderful, wonderful bass as well. So I do love flat wound basses, especially when we're doing those kind of retro tracks that we do. Um, like I just did one, the, uh, um, finished up today and I used the Yamaha and it sounds fantastic. The Yamaha bass is amazing, the BB series. But it would have been probably closer if I'd used the flats on this. Such a great sound bass. Playing Mark King lines on a short scale bass with flat wound strings on it. but it's just a great bass. Such a wonderful, wonderful bass. This is cheap. I would say you should be able to find yourself a used bass with a bolt on neck. Short scale are great for guitar players. Put some flat wound strings on it and just have one in your arsenal. Just means you've got a bass ready to go at all times with flats on it. And yeah, really smart as a producer to have a bass with flat wound strings. So let's get stuck into some questions. This first one's a good one. In fact, this first one is an excellent, excellent question. What should be recorded first when approaching a new song? Should we start with the drums, guitars over a click, and that's assuming there's no demo of the track. I love tracking bands live. Gun to my head, if I had an opportunity to record any song any way I could, it would always be 
everybody out in a really beautiful live room, you know, isolated just enough with everybody interacting with each other and performing together and feeding off ideas and sharing ideas and working on a song together. It's the way all of the music that I grew up listening to was made, whether it be Queen or Zeppelin or the Beatles or the Stones or any of those bands that we love. The Eagles, you name it, they all sat in a room and they worked together. They rehearsed together, did pre-production together, and they recorded together. And then they would fix things and maybe do overdubs, but essentially the basic song was tracked live in a room. That's most of the stuff we listen to that we love, even through the late 70s and the 80s, and quite a number, a decent amount of songs by the 90s. But essentially, that's how great records were made because of the interaction between the musicians. Now, that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is when you're doing it like that, you're building around a song. You're probably thinking, what the heck am I talking about? What I mean is that there is a singer in the room playing acoustic guitar or piano or whatever it might be, or maybe not playing an instrument, but singing a song with a band. So the band is interacting with the singer maybe doing some pushes to hit the vocal inflections, maybe laying back a bit as the singer lays back into the track. All of that is only possible with the interaction. So when you ask what should you track first, a scratch, a really good quality scratch track. One that is a vocal and acoustic, vocal and piano, whatever it is you want to do, but that is what you should get down first. If you put the drums down first and you kind of grid them and just do this perfect drum take, the singer is then like singing over this sort of perfect track when really the musicians should be interacting with the singer. Now there's plenty of music, plenty of music that can be robotic. Of course it can be. There's certain genres which just sound great as just machine-like almost. However, for most of the music I love and many of you, it was built around that vocal. So get a scratch guitar or a scratch piano and a vocal down first. So when you're tracking, you're tracking to that vocal. You're tracking to that performance. You understand if the singer is singing a melody that's like, ah, da, 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 da. drummer's like, catching those inflections. If the drummer doesn't have that scratch to work off, it's, it could be just dun, 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 It might just be a freight train of a beat. Think about it. You think about like Ringo and all of these great drummers that we love that weren't technically all of this. They all played the song. I think of like, heard it through the grapevine, for instance. I talk about this a lot. The groove is just a boom, 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 boom. It follows everything. If the bass line is like, Boom, oh, James Jameson's bass line. Boom, 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 boom. So he's playing the vocal melody and the groove. Everything is locking it together. Everybody in that band is playing the same song. If they didn't have a scratch vocal on there, a good scratch vocal and a basic rhythm, acoustic, something, how are you going to do that if you're just building a track? So don't start with the drums. Start with a decent scratch, vocal and acoustic, and then put them, often I do the drums last. When Blair comes in and plays on the demos that we do when we're reviewing gear, often he's the last person on it. Sometimes he's the second to last, but we'll have done, you know, Katie or Mikhail will have sung a vocal and acoustic guitar, I maybe even have played bass and electric, and then he comes in and plays drums. And it never sounds out of place. He is using the whole band to play off and perform. That old idea of like, which is sort of 90s production, which is like, put the drums down, edit the drums tight, put the bass down, you know, edit the bass tight, put the guitar. It, it just gives you tracks that sound sterile. At the time, it was, it was fresh and new and exciting because everything did live and breathe and kind of morph. And then suddenly this music came out where everything was just like, dun, dun, ka, dun, 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 ka. you know, all of the emo stuff was essentially just recorded, gridded, samples put in, bass recorded, gridded. Those records of the late 90s and early 2000s, those rock records, just nowadays sound like what most people can do with a good DAW because it was super heavily edited with lots of samples put in it. And hey, it was a genre and it was a time but 
there's a great movement back to feel and groove, and it is wonderful. Because we now know that anybody with a DAW can create these super, super tight, perfectly in tune, perfectly in time records. But what they can't do is reproduce feel and groove. That is so difficult to do. That's why you need musicians interacting or at least working from a song, even if you're doing it all on your own. I've done many songs on my own where I've played all the instruments, but I've started off with a really good scratch vocal. And what we do a lot now is if I've got a really cool guitar idea, I'll put that down and then maybe I'll do the bass. But the last couple we've done, I've done the bass immediately after the scratch before anything else because it's, I feel like, the bass line can be one of the most important parts of the track because it's gonna glue things together. It's gonna to help dictate the drum part, but it's also going to glue in melodic elements and harmonic elements. I mean, that's the thing about the bass is it's, it sits there and makes everything work together. So often I'll spend more time thinking about the perfect bass line than I do about anything else. Because once I've got that and it, glues with the drums and with the with the scratch guitars or the basic guitars I should say and the vocal everything else seems to fall into place you know to answer your question in another way after you've got your scratch vocal and scratch guitar or scratch keyboards go to do the bass next before you even do the drums if you have to redo the bass afterwards that's okay I've done that too as well but at least the bass will start painting something. Maybe you can get into like a groove idea on the bass. So when the drummer comes in, he's not just playing straight kick and snare ideas against the track. He or she, the drummer, will be thinking of like a groove thing because you've already done a like, so you start kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. And to answer that even more in depth, because this has been a 20 minute answer, don't be afraid to track something, and then when something else is tracked and it takes it in a different direction, retract the thing that has to be retracked. You know, we just um, did a whole piece on the album Reckless by Brian Adams, which is a total masterpiece that uh, Bob Clearmountain produced with him and an engineered and mixed. And they recorded and re recorded some songs multiple times until they were absolutely happy with it. And it's a masterpiece of a record. It is the pinnacle of his career and one of the greatest rock albums of all times. So sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. Thank you for that amazing question. I knew it was going to spark off 20 minutes of Warren going off on one, but I really, really enjoyed that question. It was a fantastic question. Oh, well, here's a good question. We have the Produce Like a Pro Academy. Somebody asked me, do I need to be working in Pro Tools to become a member of the Academy? No, you don't. Now, I do use Pro Tools as my main DAW because I've been using it since 90, <laughs> yeah, a long time. I think, I can't remember if it was like 3.8 or 4.3, that's when I started, so like mid, late 90s. It's been a long ass time, 20, at least 25 years of using Pro Tools. Wow, I feel old when I say that, 25 years. Um, so I know it inside out. They still use the old key commands, so that's fantastic. So I can still use the stuff that I learned in the 90s. And I know it inside out and I can edit really fast on it without even thinking, about breaking a sweat. But that doesn't mean that you have to be a Pro Tools person if you want to join the Produce Like a Pro Academy. The Produce Like a Pro Academy has every single kind of user in there that uses all kinds of DAWs like all kinds of DAWs. So you don't have to be a Pro Tools user. There's a word that really bugs people when they say industry standard. Pro Tools is an industry standard in one respect. It's the, a default one that recording studios will always have. That's where that, that phrase gets kind of used and abused because if you go to Europe, a lot of people use Cubase. If you work in certain genres like EDM and stuff like that, a lot of it's done in Ableton Live. It just is. I know guys that compose and create exclusively in Fruity Loops, in FL Studio, as it's now known. I know film composers that still work and still love Digital Performer. So the point is, is like, there's no one thing that works and is a standard, but I will say Pro Tools by the people I know in the industry do tend to use Pro Tools. However, there's lots of people that don't. You don't have to be a Pro Tools user. It's just the one I prefer and I like to use. But if you're already really, really good at a particular DAW, there's no reason to change. And if you join the Produce Like a Pro Academy, yeah, there's a lot of Pro Tools users in there. But there's also a lot of Cubase users and a lot of Logic users and a lot of Studio One users and a lot of Reaper users and a lot of everything else. 
So please join us. Um, <laughs> please come and join us in the Produce Like a Pro Academy. Thanks, everyone. That was a wonderful, wonderful uh, Fact Friday. I really enjoyed doing it. I am currently on holiday when this comes out. So I will try and answer any questions, but please leave some more Fact Friday questions underneath. I love doing these. Thanks ever so much. So long. Farewell. La vida's day and au revoir. Adios. Goodbye. Juice.